This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by Tanara Music Practice Platform. Hi everyone, it's Tim here again with an advanced warning about something very special we're offering from December 5th this year and you guys are going to be the first to hear about it. You see, with so many podcast listeners, blog readers and members spread all around the world, we've been getting more and more requests to offer a way for people to experience the action and inspiration of Piano Pivot Live, my Melbourne-based event in January, even if they can't make it to Australia. And so I've been chatting to my team about how we can help you guys and after lots of discussion, we've decided to offer virtual tickets to Piano Pivot Live. Yes, I know this is very exciting. Your virtual ticket will give you access to fully edited, professional multi-camera video recordings of all our keynotes, workshops, plenary sessions, and plenty of bonus materials and downloads, including audio files and the complete delegate handbook so that you can listen like you would to this podcast or watch the videos and do all the activities that the delegates would have been doing. You'll have a full year in which to enjoy access and can refer back to the videos as many times as you want. That will be around 10 hours of professional development in professional video recordings with incredible speakers and you'll be able to enjoy that. Um, online at your own pace. Now, please note we're not live streaming the conference. These are recorded videos that will be available within one month from the live conference and then for a year after that. So we're going to be doing all the editing and making them look absolutely amazing, making sure the sound's right and you can see the PowerPoints and all that kind of stuff. So just be aware it's not a live stream. We'll be giving access to virtual lounge tickets from next week. Stay tuned. I'll be telling you all on the podcast. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Season 3, 2019 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We're almost at the end of the season, and we're almost at 180 episodes. Crazy, I know. Uh, my name is Tim Topham, your host for this show. And uh, for you guys, if this is your first time listening, then a very warm welcome to you, and a very special welcome, of course, to my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community members. This is episode number 179, and we've got a great show coming up for you today. I'm going to introduce my guests in just a moment. But before that, just a couple of quick reminders regarding regarding Piano Pivot Live, my conference here in Melbourne in January. If you haven't got your tickets yet, then you should do that very, very soon because there's a few things that are happening in this next uh, four weeks or so. Firstly, if you have a friend, make sure you grab a ticket and you'll see when you check out that there is in fact a bring a friend and get your friend half price. So you can split the difference and get a discount on both your tickets. So it's a bring a friend promotion. It's available until around Christmas time in December. So if you bring a friend along, the friend is only half the price of your ticket. So split the difference, come along to Piano Pivot Live. It's going to be an extraordinary conference. I've just been working again on the schedule uh, this week and it's just shaping up to be uh, just a wonderful, warm, enriching innovative uh, and exciting lineup of speakers and activities that we've got for everyone. Now, as you heard in the last couple of episodes as well, all ticket holders will be in the draw for the Kawaii brand new digital piano worth almost four and a half thousand dollars so you'll be able to enter that anyone that's at the event can enter that and we are doing one more promotion up until december 5th which is just about the time when i'll be releasing my next episode you've got you've got about a week from today if you do buy your ticket before december 5 not only will you get the opportunity at Piano Pivot Live to enter that competition for the Kawaii Piano, but you'll also have a chance to win one year of free Inner Circle membership. We're giving away a free, full access annual membership to one lucky Piano Pivot Live ticket holder. And for five runner-ups, we're going to be posting you one of our t-shirts, which have been kind of blowing up a little bit online. Everyone seems to love them. So I've got to work out a way to make those available to you. But at the moment, they're completely exclusive. We're only using them uh, as uh, a promotion and things to give away to special people like the five runner-ups who will all receive a t-shirt as part of getting their ticket to Piano Pivot Live. But one lucky ticket holder will be going away with the Kawaii Piano and another will 
will be going away with a free annual membership, 12-month membership to my inner circle where we now have well over 30 of my flagship courses produced by all sorts of amazing people around the world. We've got all our lesson plans, downloads. The discounts are are just going crazy. Uh, Most people are being able to make their membership fees back very quickly just in the discounts that they're getting through our promotional um, perks and discounts. So it really is a fantastic opportunity to get involved in the inner circle. So you'll get all the details about it when you buy your ticket, but you have to do it before December 5th. Okay, guys? So make sure you head to pianopivotlive.com. All right, on to today's show. And I have to say, I was a little bit starstruck by today's guests. Uh, One of them, and we've got two guests today, is a great friend who I've spent lots of time with when I've been traveling to conferences in America. In fact, I stayed with him when I went to the MTAC conference a year or two ago. But the other one I'd never met um, and had been totally wowed when viewing his performances online. Um, In fact, I'm pretty much in awe of any pianist who can play all the Chopin etudes without a break and without a mistake. And one of my guests today can do that. It's amazing. So today's episode is all about the challenges of performance and how we can help our students with their and our performance anxiety um, by finding flow and rhythm in our playing and also what to do during practice to try and help those nerves that can be all too common and can really cripple people in their performing. And I know I certainly... um, have issues of, uh, well, I mean, I guess we all get nerves when we're going to perform, but uh, I certainly wouldn't want to have a life of a concert pianist because that's just not something that I'd want to do. But for our students, uh, it's equally as daunting when we get them up on stage in front of everyone to play. And sometimes giving them a few tips can really help. So today we're going to unpack practice routines and hints and strategies for performance and explore some new repertoire created for advanced pianists by one of my guests as well. Oh, we're also going to talk about using Kickstarter to fund performances and album recordings and pretty much anything that uh, you do in your studio. So uh, check that out as well. Today's show notes and full transcript are now available at topmusic.co slash episode 179. So as I said, we've got two guests today. My first guest is pianist composer Jeremy Siskind. He started teaching at the collegiate level at age 19, earning his first tenure-track job at Western Michigan University at age 25. Amazing, right? An in-demand clinician, Siskind has written 11 publications with Hal Leonard, including the landmark instructional books Jazz Band Pianist and First Lessons in Piano Improv. He currently teaches at California's Fullerton College, chairs the NCKP's Creativity Track, and spreads peace through music in places like Lebanon, Tunisia, and Thailand with the non-profit organization Jazz Education Abroad. And my second guest is the one and only Frederick Chu. He's an internationally renowned concert pianist who often collaborates with both classical and jazz pianists to bring vivid live concert experiences to all his audiences. He's known for his innovative programming, including his classical smackdowns, a multi-year series where composers face off in head-to-head comparisons with listeners voting for their favorite composer, for example, Debussy versus Prokofiev, Bach versus Glass, etc. Frederick has over 27 recordings, including the most extensive, complete piano works of Prokofiev and works of Chopin, Liszt, Ravel, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Rossini and Grieg as well as Beethoven List Symphony 5 and the solo piano version of The Carnival of the Animals. Welcome to the show, Jeremy and Frederick. Great pleasure to be here. Great to be here, Tim. Very cool to hang out with both of you. Uh, look, I have to say I'm a little bit starstruck because I am sitting here interviewing two phenomenal pianists. I can only dream to be able to play at the level you guys do. But the, well, I think that one of the coolest things is, is one of you, Jeremy, well-known jazz pianist and composer as well. Frederick, on kind of the other end of the scale, incredible performer, but more on the classical end of the scale. But I know, Frederick, you do also do quite creative things with your recitals, which we'll talk about later on. And we've got heaps of things that we could talk about, but I want to keep it as strict and uh, kind of structured as we possibly can. But I think we should probably start with a bit of an intro, if we can. So maybe start with Jeremy. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself for those of you who haven't heard of you or don't know who you are? Sure. My name is Jeremy Siskin. <clears throat> By day, I'm a uh, college professor. I teach at Florida College in California in the U.S. 
um, by night. And other times I'm a pedagogue. I have a, I think I'm up to 13 publications with Hal Leonard. Um, I'm a jazz pianist and uh, I'm actually working on publishing, self-publishing my first collection of concert music, which is the Perpetual Motion A Fantastic. And I know that's taken you hours and hours and hours and weeks and months and years. And he's going to take even more time. We'll unpack those in a little bit of depth in a moment. Um, but over to you, Frederick, tell us about yourself. Uh, I'm a concert pianist, classical. Uh, I've, uh, I don't count the years anymore that I've <laughs> been playing piano, but I've played all over the world. I have close to 30 CDs uh, that are available. Uh, music from Bach to Chopin to uh, Schoenberg to contemporary composers. Uh, I'm known for the music of uh, Prokofiev. Uh, I've, com I've recorded everything that Prokofiev ever wrote for piano, and then I've actually no written way. descriptions of other things, and orchestral things. And uh, I, I had the great pleasure of, of knowing the two sons of Prokofiev, the composer, and, and their children. And I, so I know the family, and I feel very uh, uh, emotionally invested in that and feel like that's uh, one of the things I'm the most proud of, bringing Prokofiev, uh, the importance of Prokofiev's music to people. Wow, fantastic. That is uh, that is quite, <laughs> I imagine recording anyone's whole works is a huge challenge. I've heard of people trying to do it for Bach and Beethoven and those guys as well. It must be yeah. massive. Um, are you still teaching, Frederick? Uh, well, it's, it's funny that you would ask. I, I have taught master classes and workshops for a long time. I, I developed my own workshop series called Deeper Performance Studies. And actually, that's how I met Jeremy, who uh, attended uh, some of my workshops and learned things such as uh, how to learn a piece without practicing it and how to play piano better by cooking, things like that. <laughs> so I have a lot of experience teaching that way. But I'd like to take this opportunity, and this is the very first time I'm going public with this, Jeremy. It'll be a surprise to you. Oh, I like a, a scoop. Good, tomorrow. Good. Uh, that I am taking a tenure track position at the Carnegie Mellon University. Oh. Uh, teaching piano and uh, introducing some very, uh, I hope, revolutionary but uh, very productive ways of teaching piano, learning piano in a university setting. Wow, that is amazing. Congratulations. Very exciting yeah, news for you. Well, can I just pick up on that? Because I was on your website and um, let me just read you a, a tiny little bit from, from your website. It, it said um, of you, Frederick, it said his non-traditional approach, including interdisciplinary collaborations, integration of new technologies and emphasis on audience engagement is one thing that sets you apart from others uh, in recitals and performances. Can you tell us more about why, one, why you're doing that and two, what that actually looks like? Well, you know, Music is this incredible art, which uh, is timeless in some ways. You know, we're still playing music written by masters from 300, 400 years ago on this instrument that was invented three, 400 years ago. Uh, and the reason why music can do that is because it uh, is timeless. It doesn't refer to current events or it doesn't depend on language. It, it's a language in and of itself. And so I think it's something that has to evolve. It has to, uh, in some ways, be a living art. And so for me, classical piano is this incredible place to explore. One can spend a whole lifetime exploring just a small part of what's out there as the canon of classical music. And, and at, at the same time, it has to be presented in a way that speaks to people today and make it relevant today and that means bringing in technology where it's helpful for engaging audiences it's all about engaging audiences first of all so if, if your audience is not engaged of course it doesn't matter what you do uh, and then how do you engage them you talk to them you uh, use technology that brings them closer to the to the creative process to the performance process uh, you bring in collaborators who have a perspective on things that that makes makes the the old classical music fresh so it's something that that really one has to pay attention to and i think you know to to bring jeremy into this one of the things i admire about jeremy is that he has such a great knowledge and 
experience in classical music and he's doing jazz and he's constantly referring to Debussy and Prokofiev and all of these things. And, well, you know, when, when I listen to Jeremy's music, I say, oh, he stole that from Debussy. I can hear that, <laughs> which is a great thing because that means that it's fresh. That means it's, he's bringing all these current things and past things together and, and making it something that, that means something right now. Any thoughts on that, Jeremy? Um, I know who to steal from. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's right. That's, that's the first key. That's half of my classical training is figuring out who to steal from. Um, I'm lucky that I get to um, I get to teach both classical and jazz pianists as part of my job, and I love staying engaged in classical music. Um, I don't perform it in public because there's people like Frederick and many others who uh, really have spent their entire life dedicating themselves to that music. But I play it for myself, and I feel like above all for me even though I'm a jazz player primarily, I'm a pianist. And the music, uh, the, the instrument comes with this incredibly rich tradition and understanding and learning from that tradition uh, just seems to be such a key part of developing a sound no matter what style you're playing, whether you're trying to play rock, rock and roll, jazz, um, or you know the classic concert music. Mm. So do you think the the traditional the re, the truly traditional classical recital where performer is in bow tie tuxedo comes on stage doesn't say a word through the whole thing performs bows leaves do you think there's the that's got a there's an end date on that uh jeremy you want to take this <laughs> i certainly have opinions about that I, I would love to hear your opinions on this one frederick <laughs> you know i i, I still have my tail and uh, I think the last time I wore them was maybe 15 years ago when I was playing with uh, a, a wonderful violinist, uh, but of the older school. And he, he was very traditional, uh, a beautiful player, but he wanted to preserve some of the old customs. And so I had those tales for him. Uh, literally, I would pull them out only to play concerts with him. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I wear a Chinese jacket, so you know, it's, it's I don't like the colors. I I, I don't mind uh, opening my mouth and talking to the audience. I think that it really depends on the audience, but I think I can say across the board, all audiences today, whether they're connoisseurs or complete novices or complete non-musicians, they all are expecting some kind of personal interaction and that means opening your mouth and saying something to show them that you're a real person that means wearing something that isn't completely like wow what is that uh, but something that you might see in another context uh, something that's that means here's something significant that's going to happen here's an event so respecting the moment but not necessarily stylistically, you know, like going back to some tradition just because that was how it used to be. Mm. I'm, I'm gonna agree and disagree at the same time. I think um, you're right in 90% of the cases, but when I think of the best concert experiences, like the just most meaningful stab me in the heart concert experiences I've been to, it hasn't been somebody who's explicating the music um, to that degree, but it's been something that could kind of almost approach prayer or meditation. Mm. And I think there there can be this atmosphere that that's created by the greatest, greatest, greatest artists that approaches that almost church cathedral totally. like holiness. And totally. so I, I don't know. I think there's room for both. But I think what, what you said that I totally agree with is that it's all about context. So who are you as a performer? Who is the audience? What's the venue? Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, Frederick, you know well that I do a lot is house concerts and. In that context, I think it's crucial to talk to the audience Thank because you. we have this very informal venue. Um, but I could imagine going, you know, being at a very formal venue or a very spiritual venue where talking isn't the thing. So Absolutely. I don't know. I think there's room for all of the approaches, but it has to be Absolutely. authentic to the performer and to the venue. 
Yeah, you certainly don't want a uh, someone who's really reserved and introverted trying to speak and engage an audience when really they That's should just be worst. playing the piano. <laughs> yeah, because I've seen that happen, and yeah, not not so good. Yeah, that um, that can actually do damage. Uh, you yeah. Know, to the, somebody's memory of an experience yeah but hopefully it's something that pedi- uh, not pedagogy but performance courses these days would hopefully teach uh students about uh, you know about obviously how to perf- how to promote their performances how to do social media the business side of things but also how to stand up and engage an audience uh, maybe that's not quite got there yet but i think it's a good idea right no absolutely and i think jeremy is right of course one has to take the temperature of the room and one has to push the envelope. And if coming out and, and creating a sense of concentration, a sense of mystery, a sense of intrigue by not opening your mouth for whatever reason, uh, but just going right into music that one has to concentrate on, absolutely. You know, I think those are the rare occasions, rare uh, these days, where people who, you're lucky if you get a full house uh, at some of these concerts that that, uh, that you have to play. Mm. And how do you keep them there? How do you not turn them off? And so it's a, it's a delicate balance, absolutely. Yeah, I think, uh, well, there's two thoughts. And Tim, sorry, we're probably going on too long, but this is fascinating. The one, you know, I think of Keith, Keith Jarrett going and giving a solo recital. And he's not going to talk. It's not in his personality, and nor would I want him to, because, you know, you're just in this meditative bliss um but then the other thing that i'm thinking about is about you frederick and um i attended a concert you were doing classical smackdown was that what you called it that's right uh, <laughs> i like the sound of that <laughs> yeah you you describe it because obviously you'll, yeah, you'll be- Smack, smackdown is a series basically to the music of two composers uh organized into rounds so that you have a little of each composer in each round and there's the pieces are selected to really create a a contrast or a comparison and the audience listens and then they vote for their favorite. So it's a very simplistic thing and it, it you know it implies that there's a best but it gets people to look inside themselves and see how they're reacting to the music. And if if the choice makes them see what they value or, or what are the things what are the criteria for them that make them appreciate this music over that music then that's all a good thing so it's it's a it's a way for for me to to introduce people who may not have the confidence to say i like this music or i don't like that music uh because they feel like they they haven't gone to classical piano concerts so how could they possibly say you know be so pretentious as to say I I like Debussy more than Prokofiev. Oh, you can. It's just like if you had two bites of a dish created by two different chefs, and you taste this one and that one, you can say I like this one better than that. You know, like this one's saltier. I like that. <laughs> Whatever it is. And the classical smackdown is a format that's built for audience interaction and for cultivating the audience member's own uh, sense of listening and their own taste and to really understand what their own values are i'd love to dive into performance and particularly performance nerves and anxiety uh because that's a real challenge for uh, both teachers who want to perform at their recitals uh and also helping their students too and um just starting with frederick i you know i listened to your chopin etudes recordings on uh, on mm-hmm. youtube and i think i said just before we started that literally my right speaker on my macbook pro blew during your playing like it was it was i don't know if i had it too loud or whatever and then it just squeaked for the next like i had to turn it <laughs> off i had to like pan everything left um what what i'm amazed about as someone who's tried to play a number of the chopin etudes is is not just that it was a beautiful performance and well interpreted because i always put that above perfection but really, I had trouble picking a, a wrong note, and that was an hour of some of the hardest music ever written. So, can you give us some suggestions or strategies, uh, particularly for for teachers who will be listening around this idea of how do you actually get into such a, an incredible place where you can perform such hard repertoire so flawlessly? Well, you are right. The Chopin etudes, especially for me, the Opus Ten, it is like walking on the on a tightrope it is so risky and and so nerve-wracking 
I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear that. Because I, I would say I one of the hardest moments in music is finishing Opus 10 number one, the big arpeggios in the right hand, and then starting up Opus 10 number two, which has a chromatic. That's the chromatic one, right? Yeah. Three, four and five. That transition, oh my God. It, you know, once you get past that, I think uh, I don't start really coming back to reality until about etude number seven. <laughs> 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 I'm still reacting to that. You know, in terms of approaching something like that, it's really important to be able to have kind of a, an exterior regard on oneself. If one is caught up in the emotions of performing, you know, it, you're never going to play it perfectly. No matter how perfect it sounds, I know what's gone right and what's gone wrong. I know what's gone the way I expected and what's not gone the way I expected. And anytime my sense of what should happen doesn't coincide with what actually happens, emotions start stirring. Yep. The emotions are the chemicals in our body that wash over us to try to get us back in sync with reality. It's because the mind has such a strong ability, such a strong need to predict the future that we have emotions because sometimes our sense of reality is so far away from what actually is going to happen or what what really happened that the only way you can get back to reality is just like a huge push like get back in line <laughs> uh, it's not like it's not like a mental exercise where you say oh i made a little mistake there i need to adjust my numbers you know like uh, you know i added one too many it's just like you're in the wrong place and 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 literally you have to wash yourself free of where you are and, and go over somewhere else. And that's what emotions do. If we're caught up in the emotions of performing, if we think we know how it's gonna go, if we if we're holding fast to our expectations, then our emotions are gonna be just stronger for for all of that effort and we're going to be washed more and more and it's basically going to be this water under our feet uh it's a very difficult perspective to have and that's something that one has to practice one has to first recognize yeah i need to what is that feeling like what what, what is that perspective how do, how do i how do i recognize when i'm there it's kind of like it's kind of like being in the zone but it's not like being in the zone where you're lost. It's being in the zone where you're just free to watch. Hmm. And once you're there, then you you practice staying there. But so so I think it's a two step process. One is to really like what is it that you're even looking for, and then second, when you get there, how do you stay there? Yeah, and it's a and, process. And Jeremy, you've you've mentioned the word flow before. It sounds like uh, in the zone. This is kind of a flow state. What what's your your um approach to managing your nerves yeah well that's so interesting um because this is something as a jazz pianist that i struggle with with maybe like an opposite goal um with my goal being to get rid of any expectations that something might sound that something might go in a particular direction because if um as frederick's saying exactly with his classical piece if your expectations start going awry from the reality those for me are the moments when i Panic. So part of my um, goal in you know trying to approach this flow state is to rid myself of expectations and instead accept whatever the feedback is coming in from the music. And as a jazz musician, that could also be from other musicians, right? Things really go wrong as a jazz musician when you think, oh, the drummer is about to do this, and then they totally don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> then you're then you're really lost. So if instead you can actually get into this accepting place, um, and it's almost a childlike thing of just enjoying the sound, enjoying the feedback, instead of trying to control everything. Um, for me, that's that's when I can start to approach uh, that state that Frederick's talking about. I was going to ask you a really controversial question, and I don't know if it actually has an answer, um, but do either of you think that either jazz or classical performance is harder than the other? Yeah, for me, jazz is harder. <laughs> <laughs> the, re the reason well, I ask is because... Whenever, yeah, for, whenever for, I'm in the 
presence of a jazz pianist, I'm just like, oh my God, that is unbelievable. How can you, how can you do that? How can the mind do that? How can the hands react that way? And of course, I, I would say pretty much jazz pianists, when they come to my concert, they're saying the same thing. Yeah, see, for me, I feel like I'm playing tennis without a net. You know, there's no, <laughs> there's no standard if you got it right or wrong. So um, it's, I look at somebody like Frederick playing the Chopin Etudes, and I think, A, I'm incapable of doing that. And B, boy, there's an awfully big net there. <laughs> <I'm> yeah, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm thinking, because in classical uh, recitals, you, there is an expectation that you will play all the notes as written, and people know the repertoire so well that they know any instant of a mistake. Whereas in jazz, you don't have that um, so much you hanging over your head. If I were going to be devil's advocate, I would say that you have to figure out a way to surprise and delight an audience for an hour without a bit of preparation <laughs> in <laughs> the traditional sense. And right. so that's a pretty big ask. Um, but I mean, as a jazz pianist, I would much rather have to do that than have to play the Chopin <laughs> Um, so, uh, Frederick, just on something like the etudes, and uh, you could substitute any of the hard classical and traditional romantic repertoire, did you learn a lot of that when you were a child, and did that make things easier for you? I would say that uh, I learned a lot of it when I was a child. Uh, a lot of Opus 10 I learned as a child, and by child I mean before age uh, 15. Uh, and you know, my, I, I have a, a teacher uh, who I respect a lot, who brought me really a, my sense of style and brought me to a respect of the piano tradition, the, the great piano tradition, and that's Abby Simon, who I studied with at Juilliard. He's 99, almost 100, and still playing, uh, just an amazing model. And he told me once, everything he learned before the age of 30 he can pretty much sit down and play without practicing. And mm. everything he learned after age 40, he forgets as soon as he stops playing. <laughs> I've actually heard unfortunately, too I'm of the age where I can vouch that that is absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Abby Simon speaking. I would say everything I learned before age 20, I can sit down and kind of play. And I wish I had spent more time before the age of 20 just turning to repertoire, you know, knowing that now. And everything I learned after the age, uh, I would say 40, yeah, 35, 40, it's just the mind starts calcifying and it's hard to, to etch in anything new. It's possible, but it's it's really much more of a challenge. Yeah, get started early. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm super delighted that Tanara is supporting this season of the podcast and wanted to take a minute to tell you what they offer. Tanara creates an inspiring community for music teachers and students throughout each week. We know that apps don't teach quality music. Teachers do, and Tanara can make your teaching even more engaging. Help your students discover the difference effective practice can make. Tanara is available on mobile, tablet, and desktop. So head to tanara.com, that's T-O-N-A-R-A.com, and sign up for a 30-day free trial, or head to your respective mobile store on your device and download the app. Let Tanara create happiness in your studio today. So, Jeremy, I want to talk about your um, perpetual motion etude. So, um, before I ask you my questions about it, tell us what, what is this great thing that you've been working on? Yeah, so it's a lot. It's a, um, a self-published book of, and a CD and video series of nine through-composed etudes with optional improvisation sections. So, um, they're designed so that a concert pianist, such as Frederick, um, could perform the etudes as a set of miniatures or for a jazz pianist such as myself to perform the etudes as a more full set, um, kind of a concert length program of pieces that involve improvisation. Um, and this was a passion project for me in part because of what we were talking about, Tim, that, that uh, achieving flow in a performance has always been something that's been really elusive for me. And perpetual motion requires you to kind of uh, maintain some sort of level of concentration at the very least, if not flow, that's uninterrupted. Um, by a kind of outside stimuli and distraction that you can kind of keep it going. So I wrote these pieces uh, in part to challenge myself to meet that, uh, that goal of achieving better flow um, and partially to help other pianists of uh, testing themselves as well. 
Yeah, I was going to say it's it sounds like the exact opposite of what you want if you want to practice trying to get into flow because at least with uh, romantic repertoire, even Bach, you've got breaks every now and then where you can <laughs> take a breath. You know, in one of your etudes, you are you are going once you start, you're you're going all the way through. So, so what what tips are you giving for your? I, I assume you're probably introducing these to your students or have done so. Uh, if not, what would you say to your students? How how do they get into that mindset where they can take off and keep on going? Yeah, great question. Um, the first thing that I see with my students is to breathe. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> my students, and I find this myself, especially when you, they're approaching a hard place, I see the breath just totally stop. And I think that's the first thing that's really going to stop flow. Um, the second thing that I really notice with myself is that there's a physical tension that comes in. Again, usually in advance of some difficult spot or triggered by some ego kind of a thought like sometimes it's you're doing great and then I freeze <laughs> sometimes it's you're not that good sometimes it's oh that guy that I really respect walked into the room <laughs> and those are the thoughts that cause me to freeze so one of the things that I work on and I try to coach my students on is um, to recognize those thoughts and then be able to dismiss them you're never probably going to get to that point um, where those thoughts never occur to you um, but you can practice actually consciously having those thoughts and then dismissing them. And then thirdly, um, I would say that you wanna practice performing. And that means making a conscious time in your practice routine, um, kind of as Frederick alluded to, where um, you're almost looking down at yourself playing and you're trying to give a full performance of whatever the piece is and trying to not exactly lose yourself, but it's somewhere related in that concept of losing yourself in the music, right? A lot of the practice that we do is very conscientious practice to try to break a habit or to learn a new piece of repertoire, but you have to make a little bit of time to actually practice performing because that is a skill. Mm. Do you find uh, that turning recorders or videos and things like that on can help you or your students when you're in to, to put you in that performance mode? Yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the things that um, people with performance anxiety can do to help themselves through it is recognize all the different levels of performance, right? Performance could be in front of a video. It could be in front of an audio recorder. It could be in a practice room with, for just a couple of friends, right? Um, it could be for your dog or cat. <laughs> uh, my, my dog is the toughest critic of my playing. <laughs> He's rough. Uh, yeah. Oh, love it, love it. Um, <laughs> or it could be in front of your teacher. I, I'm sure uh, piano teachers will relate to this, that you have students who come in and say, I could play this perfectly at home, but as soon as I play it in front of you, it's not working anymore, right? Because it's another level of performance. And um, one of the reasons that I really wanted Frederick to be a part of this conversation is he taught me something really valuable in his deeper performance studies. Um, he, one of the exercises he did was to imagine different audiences and different performance venues and think, you know, what's your ideal audience? And what's the audience that would terrify you the most? And when you're practicing performing, you can envision in your mind being in front of those people or on that stage, um, either among the people who make you really comfortable <laughs> or among the people who would terrify you the most. A room full of piano teachers. <laughs> is, that, is that the worst for you, Tim? I, <laughs> Some people, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, if I was playing hard repertoire, that would be the that would be the hardest. I think. Um, what What are your thoughts on that, um, Frederick, in regard to practicing performing? Yeah, you know, performing is this thing. When we're in the practice room, we're practicing. Performing is a moment when it's like a chemistry experiment that requires some heat and you set it all up during the, the practice room session and then you turn on the heat and it's a one-time thing. It's going to happen. And the only thing that you can really do in a performance is watch and remember. Uh, so now what do you mean and, by that? Because when I'm performing, I'm just trying to not freak out. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. It, it, you're not. You're trying to not freak out. You're acting in a completely different way. You're reacting in a completely different way than you would in the practice room. It's because the heat is on. You know that you have to go from beginning to end. You can't stop. You can't slow down. You can't speed up. Whatever happens, you can't like stop and say, "Oh, sorry about that. Let me try it again." 
it's it's going to happen. And that could be for one person. It could be for a microphone. It could be for a thousand people. It could be for whatever setting. It just takes that idea that this is a performance to change the whole way everything reacts, interacts with each other. What we and so the only way that I can know how I'm going to perform is by performing. I can't practice that in the practice room. I have to perform in order to see what this chemistry chain of events is going to produce, which means that I have to be in a mindset when I do perform of this is it. Here's my opportunity to see how all of this work is going to interact with each other when I turn the heat on, when I flip the switch. And people who go through a performance and at the end are so happy to have gotten through it, they don't have to think about it anymore. Oh, I got through it. Or, oh my God, that was amazing. Uh, you know, thank goodness. Or, oh, it was so terrible. I don't want to think about it anymore. They're losing out on the entire learning possibility of that experience. On the contrary, for me, after I play a performance, no matter how good or bad or whatever judgment, I play through it in my mind. Note for note, I played through it. Every single thing that happened that went right, everything that happened that went wrong, every horrible moment, you know, I was like thinking, oh, I, I don't know the note, and I didn't know the note. You know, anything that happens, I have to really be able to remember it, relive it, analyze it, understand potentially why it happened, because that's the only time it's going to happen. That's never going to happen in a practice room. And that's something that's really once you understand the difference between a practice session and a performance session and you realize the value of you know, the, the rarity of a performance and how you're going to be in a performance then you it motivates you to really be attentive and surprisingly that's a very good place to be if you want to observe yourself watching and remembering like what mistake am i going to make as opposed to i hope i don't make any <laughs> that's a, a very different mindset I have to say that I, I think that that shows the difference between your uh, your thinking and mine. I would be the one that just once it's done, it's like, oh, thank goodness that's over. <laughs> I'd never want to think about that again or do it again. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and I, uh, I, I have to say that I agree that one of the best ways to be more comfortable practicing and reduce nerves, uh, sorry, more comfortable performing and reduce nerves is to perform lots. As Jeremy said, in every different to any animate object, or inanimate and in every circumstance and situation. And that was the only way I could really get through my diploma performance exam. Here. Yeah, one, one's, one's perception is completely altered in a performance setting. You know, when I go into a recording studio and I play the first take and I go listen to it, I'm like, oh my God, why did I play so fast? Or why did I play so loud? And then the second time I go back, it's still like, oh, I'm, I'm playing too fast, playing too loud. But eventually, the more I listen, the more my sense of what, how I played and the real thing that I'm listening to on the, on the recording come together. And that's a great feeling. Mm. But, but you can see from that big gap in the first take, that's how much my perception is altered in a performance setting. And that's really something to, to, to take into consideration. How could, how could you be in a different in the same place as when you're practicing, when you're performing. You can't possibly. Right. I've got to... Uh, can I just add one thing? Uh, if there's any uh, jazz pianists listening or people teaching jazz pianists, one of the best pieces of advice that I got um, as a young jazz pianist was to get a stupid gig in a coffee shop, something that may or may not pay. Maybe you get some free coffee, you know, get booked three hours a week, get yourself a little group together, and just play because especially as jazz ensemble there's skills that you can learn about how to follow a form how to catch the other people how to develop and create a set um, that you can only really do if you're doing it <laughs> if you're out there just logging hours on the bandstand um, and so if jazz is, is in your world um, in some ways it's easier because we can play the same standards again and again week after week in a different way um, but there's no replacement for just logging that time performing. 
I wanted to talk about uh, music and memorization. And I think this is going to be more directed at Frederick, but I'm really interested in your opinion too, Jeremy, now that you have written these etudes. My feeling is that, well, for certain people, and I'm one of them, the anxiety of performing is like 10 times as worse if I don't have music in front of me. For other people, they don't really mind. So I'm wondering your thoughts on memorization and some teachers will really, they'll really say, look, if you're performing at my recital, you must memorize everything. Other teachers like me are much more free. If they want to memorize that they, they can otherwise not. Have you got any thoughts on that? The effect of memorization on performing start with Frederick. Uh, you know, memorization is this thing that Franz Liszt suddenly uh, decided, okay, everything's going to be memorized. <laughs> And nobody wanted to contradict him. And so we just have been doing that for 200 years. I, I, I'm right in the middle now of writing an article about memory techniques. And it, it assumes that memory for classical pianists is just kind of the standard that's still there. Uh, I would say it's a good thing that uh, people are feeling a little more comfortable playing with scores and certainly having the iPad and pedals makes it a lot easier to, to achieve that on just a pure physical logistic level. So that, that makes a big difference. Yeah, I feel like it's been changing recently a bit. Yeah, and, and I think that that's a good thing. That said, there are some amazing things that happen when one uh, plays from memory. Number one, it generally means that you've worked a little harder on the piece in general, I'm, you know, very, very uh, broad statements here, but mm. you know, to go on stage and play from memory means probably you've worked on a little harder than somebody who's going on stage playing it for music. Uh, it does make you listen more to the sounds that are being produced as an experience versus as a test of whether you've played the right notes. Right. Uh, and that's a good thing as well. You get to, you know, I think you're more encouraged to be in the shoes of the listener as opposed to being in the shoes of the executioner and that's a good thing mm. uh, and i think that uh, i think the last thing that's good about memory is there is a sense of freedom that comes uh, as an interpreter when you're talking about something that's more of a structure in your head versus something that's actually written down with little black lines uh, somehow the structure in, in the head can be just as intricate, but it's a little more flexible and, and, and inspiring. Uh, so for those reasons, I would say that certainly one should try to memorize some things at some time just to be able to hang on to that experience mm. without making it a hard pass rule. Yeah. What are your thoughts from the jazz perspective, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah. I think... Um, Frederick said it just about as well as I could. It's, it's interesting in the jazz world um, because in jazz we're often playing these, these things called standards, which are kind of tunes that just about every jazz musician in the world should know. Um, but recently because of technology, um, standards have become accessible via your iPad or even via your phone. You can get the right chords to basically any song in a heartbeat. So a lot fewer people are playing from memory. Um, and I think this is really bad for jazz um, for a number of reasons. The first is that there's so much more to a song than the chord changes. There's a melody, there's a lyric, there's recordings that you should be familiar with. And in fact, in jazz, the best musicians learn all their repertoire by ear from a recording. So if you're just showing up to the gig and you're pulling up the tune on your iPad, you might have the right chords, but you're missing this whole wealth of knowledge and history. Mm -hmm. I mean, it also means that people um, aren't as engaged through their ears. If they're reading, they're going to be a little bit more direct. Um, and it's just as, Fre as Frederick said, um, when you're reading something on a page, you tend to be a little bit more literal. You don't really have the structure as deeply ingrained. Um, and so people play a little bit more robotically, for lack of a better word, um, versus you, you immediately notice the difference with musicians who know these standards and have learned them by ear. They play with a lot more freedom and elasticity. So um, in my view, uh, technology has been kind of a negative thing um, in the jazz world because it's, it's allowed people to slip by with much lower standards. 
pun intended or not. Uh, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I'll take credit. Um, Jeremy, with your um, perpetual motion attitudes, I wonder, do you have uh, or are you familiar with or are they inspirations for you, uh, the works of Nikolai Kapustin and uh, Friedrich Gulda, uh, two crossover kind of jazz classical composers that I'm familiar with? Yeah, I'm a little bit familiar with Kapustin's works and not very mildly familiar with, uh, with Gulda's. Um, yeah, I think... I'm approaching it from a different standpoint. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to give a good answer to this question. Yeah. Do, I mean, do you have an inspiration for this particular, I mean, cause you could, you could have just kept on teaching jazz and doing standards and playing gigs, but I mean, this is a very specific thing you've decided to do. And I just wonder where the inspirations come from. Yeah. I mean, I'm always really interested in things that are at the nexus of uh, jazz and classical music, but um, it kind of goes back to just my interest in the piano as an instrument and stretching the capabilities of the piano, as well as training myself as a jazz pianist to do things that generally only classical pianists can do. Um, you know, jazz pianists typically, and certainly um, there's great pianists like Keith Jarrett and Brad Meldow and Fred Hirsch who are breaking free of these chains, but the typical Bill Evans style jazz pianist is playing a chord in his left hand and improvising with the right hand. Um, but if you look at classical repertoire, and especially I'm really fascinated by people like Debussy and Messiaen and Rachmaninoff, uh, there's so much more going on. There's so many more counter melodies and counterpoints and inner voices and textures at the top of the piano and these perpetual motion sorts of textures. Um, and for me, I'm just fascinated in how I can bring that all into my style as an improviser. Um, and just to be able to execute those kinds of things at the piano. So those are the kinds of things that get me really excited. Yeah, could tell it in your voice. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, I just want to change tack slightly, but still focusing on your etudes. Uh, one thing I was really excited to learn was that you launched this or you funded it through Kickstarter, which I think yeah. is a really interesting approach. Um, Frederick, I don't know if you've used any crowdfunding sourcing to put on. I did for one of my yeah. projects. Yeah, it was, and it was a wonderful experience actually to, to have done that. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that Jeremy's project was so successful. It, Congratulations to you. I haven't even really spoken to you uh, about that since the project, but that was really such a sign of support from your fans and uh, a mark of confidence that you are creating something. And that's how I felt when I did my project. And it was really such a wonderful experience. It's not the right thing for every project, but for when, when it comes together, it, it can be absolutely uh, uh, marvelous. Yeah, I mean, and you totally killed it. So, give us, uh, tell us what your goal was, what you reached, but also, can you tell us how, what what you think of the Kickstarter world and how it worked for you? Sure. Yeah, I was really fascinated by the whole experience. So, um, I think my original goal was twelve thousand dollars, and I ended up blowing past that. Um, I think I got to around sixteen thousand, which was really That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it was really spectacular. And honestly, I got the idea to do it at an MTNA conference for those international people. That's our biggest piano conference um, in the US. And I just kind of saw what a great community I had going among pianists and piano teachers. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to make this book, that's kind of, it's a little bit of a niche <laughs> thing, to be honest. There's not that many pianists out there who can play this music. Um, I've got this big community who I think would actually come through and support me. Um, and beyond that, I was excited because this gets the book out there into the hands of a lot of pianists. And of course, like any composer, what you really want is to get your music played. And, you know, maybe the book will lie around in somebody's house for a few years and then they'll pick it up and they'll try out one of the etudes and it'll inspire them. Or maybe they're a piano teacher and they'll have the book on their shelf and all of a sudden the student will come along who they'll say, oh, they could actually play one of those etudes. Um, so I'm just excited. You know, I'm going to be sending out about uh, 300, 350 copies of the book. Um, by, uh, we're talking in September by, by October. Um, and I'm just excited to get the music out there into the hands of people who are going to be able to play it. Yeah, how cool is it going to be to see people playing it on YouTube and recording it? I mean, that must be a real highlight for a composer, I imagine. Totally. And, um, you know, as a jazz pianist, I don't consider myself the best qualified to play some of these through composed works. So I'm excited. Uh, I will be sending a book to Frederick for sure and quite a few yeah, other. Can't wait to get it. Yeah. 
<laughs> a lot of really good classical pianists. And so I'm actually really just looking forward to hearing the music played by pianists who are better than me, better qualified to play them than, uh, than I am. And the main reason behind the Kickstarter was to fund the, because uh, you'd written them, it was more to fund the printing, distribution, artwork, et cetera. Is that right? Yeah, so there's so much to this project. It just keeps adding and adding. So in order to publish a book, um, I needed to hire a copyist to make the music look beautiful. I needed to hire an art designer. I need to hire, I need to obviously get it printed, pay fees to Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and the people who print them. Um, I There's also a CD portion to it, a video series of playing the works. That's um, expensive. And then yeah. A publicist. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, and I'm in the process of updating my website so that there's all kinds of resources on the website. Um, I'm really fortunate I got the great pianist Spencer Meyer to agree to be the editor of the book so that I could, you know, really make sure that a classical oriented player could play them and, uh, and it, all the music would make sense to them. So, you know, there's just a lot to, uh, a lot to do. It's been a huge project, but very rewarding. Yeah. Um, and one thing that, that I want to mention, if it's okay, is that I'm going to be traveling throughout the country and doing programs where um, I'll go to a college and the students will play the written out portion and then we'll be on two pianos and I'll play an improvisation and pass it back and forth with the students. Nice. So we'll kind of, uh, we'll tag team some of the etudes. And so um, there's just so many possibilities of, of combining uh, classical and jazz approaches here that get me excited. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> we can tell in your voice. Um, make sure you record those because they would be fantastic for your website and for YouTube as yeah. well, seeing that in action. Yeah. Um, nice work. Well, look, uh, we're up to, I don't know, 45 minutes. We're getting close to the hour and I'll, I'll we'll need to start wrapping things up quite soon. But I, I wanted to give, I want to ask one more, one more question and then go, give both of you a chance to, to kind of say anything that's on your mind or any other thoughts to conclude. But my last question is for your thoughts on competitions and whether you think they're good or bad, uh, or maybe that's the wrong question to ask. Uh, Frederick? Competitions, yeah. So this is a big topic for me. When I was uh, of competition age in my 20s, I did a few at the very beginning. Uh, I've, I've won some, some you know, good major competitions, and I've lost um, some good major competitions <laughs> as well. And I have this math kind of science background, and I was – trying to analyze the results, you know, looking at scores, trying to figure out like what is a good scoring system for, for judging pianists. And I figured out my conclusion was that competitions aren't good for, for piano, for classical piano, for, in, for encouraging personal interpretation. And so I left the competition scene when I was in my prime and it was only in the last year when I was 29 that I decided to go back to the Van Cliburn. Uh, and there were very specific reasons. One was they opened up all of the repertoire requirements so that one could play anything in the, in the solo rounds. So I said, that's good for me because I'm playing all sorts of things that aren't standard. Uh, mm -hmm. I went there, first round was all piano transcriptions. And the second round, I played Ravel and Prokofiev. So I ended up going through the competition without playing a note of Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. That's not an option. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> that was kind of a kind of a snub to the old system. But you know, this was the Van Cliburn, and it was a it called a lot of attention to me in the United States, where I uh, had kind of left. I was living in France at the time. When I was uh, kicked out of the semifinal rounds and didn't get into the final rounds, the next day I got my picture on the front page of the New York Times Arts and Leisure section. So I was extremely mm. happy with the way that competition turned out. And right. my thinking now is you know, I'm very happy to be involved as a judge. Uh, I think I would be happy sending my students to competitions when the situation seems to warrant it. Uh, but there's a lot of psychology that goes into preparing for a performance. Going in, preparing for a competition performance is a lot. It's another level, it's not right? It's about being competitive. It's about how to, all these, you know, what I was saying about expectations. The expectations are hard and fast when you go to a competition. And it's, it's a very risky situation. So one has to be psychologically, emotionally, spiritually prepared to enter a, an experience like that in order to take away the best. 
And the best is not always a prize. It's not always being recognized by the majority. Sometimes it's making a connection with one person in the audience who has no official role, but who will invite you to their uh, uh, concert series. Mm. Could be making a friend with the competitor who does go on, but you never met them before and, and they taught you something about this composer and you taught them about that composer and you keep a lifelong friendship that then develops into something. There are so many things that happen when you get great pianists to come together and turn up the heat. We just think that the prize is that thing, but there are so many other things that happen at a competition. One has to be open to being able to receive, to perceive and receive those kinds of things. Mm. Um, Jeremy, I know uh, jazz competitions, I, I don't even know if they exist, uh, but any thoughts on that? They, they, they very much do. I've, I've been uh, in more than my share. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I would agree with Frederick. I think competitions are the best. They can be kind of like a convention in the sense that they're a place where like-minded people come together. And in that sense, they're beautiful, particularly in the jazz world. Um, one of the things as I've been learning more about flow in regards to the etudes that I've been thinking about is this idea of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Um, many of you probably know what this is, but an extrinsic motivation is when you're doing something um, for an outside reason. You're doing it to please somebody else, to win a prize, to meet a requirement, whereas an intrinsic motivation is um, to do it. You're doing it just for the love of it, for the fun of it, for the experience of it. Um, and I think that most things are the most enjoyable and you're able to achieve this flow state the most if the motivation is intrinsic, when you're plat practicing, when you're performing. And so it's very hard to maintain that mindset if you're preparing for a competition and especially when you're participating in a competition. And so my advice to anybody who's involved is, I think a lot of great things can come from it. A lot of the colleagues who I value the most I've met at competition, but it's a really difficult psychological trick to maintain that sense of intrinsic motivation, even as you're pursuing something um, competitive that's kind of literally <laughs> extrinsic. Mm. Well, look, uh, guys, thank you very much for your time today. It's been really fun to chat. And I, we've covered a whole lot of different things, but it's, uh, it's been great to unpack your ideas uh, around all, all of what we've covered today. Um, but I thought, yeah, for any final thoughts, um, Frederick, on any of the topics we've talked about today? And then please let us know or let the listeners know where they can find out more about you and what you're doing. Well, I think the, you know, the, the great thing that's brought us together for this is the piano. And I, and I want to underline and, and develop just very quickly what uh, Jeremy said about uh, Rachmaninoff and, and those great composers that have where there's so many things happening. And that really is the essence of why the piano is so important, is that it's one of the very few places where we can explore this kind of multi-layered, multitasking kind of activity that really gives pleasure. And that's really important for humans. And it's one of the very, uh, I think, important reasons why the piano has been around for more than three centuries and is still around and it's healthy and people are still writing great music for it. Jeremy's still writing great music for it. And it's, and it's, it's multi-layered, it's, it's polyphonic, it's multitasking at its finest and most enjoyable. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing to, for everybody to explore, whether you're playing or you're listening, it, all of that is, is getting stimulated. Mm. Uh, and where, what's your website? Where can people find out about you? Uh, my website, uh, as a friend of mine says, uh, his website is the uh, same, Narcissist.com. No, <laughs> FrederickChu.com. It's FrederickChu.com. And, it's, and uh, all there are videos, links, uh, recordings, uh, contact, uh, all, all of it you can find it. Brilliant. And uh, information I, I saw there about your other projects, things that you've done, workshops you do, all that kind of stuff. It was quite fascinating to, to see the yeah. point of yeah. your... Um, impact i guess and can you just spell your web address for people frederick chu f-r-e-d-e-r-i-c-c-h-i-u.com fantastic thank you very much and jeremy wrapping up any final thoughts and you better let us know where we can get your etudes 
Yeah, I'm going to wrap up on a much less profound and much more capitalistic <laughs> note. Uh, by the time this podcast comes out, the etude should be available for public consumption. Um, from my website, you, you should be order, able to order either a physical copy or a PDF um, of the etudes, and they'll also be available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. Um, so I might not have mentioned their artist level pieces, probably appropriate for a college level or concert pianist <laughs> yep. uh, level. Yes, pianist. Not beginner they're, etudes. They're pretty <laughs> tough, <laughs> um, but maybe, you know, teacher level. So treat yourself to a new book of music. I just got the proof copy. It looks really beautiful. Um, and there will also be videos of, of myself playing the etudes and uh, some kind of instructional video tips up on the website too. So I'm just really excited by all the support that I've gotten so far about this new music and excited to share it with pianists and piano teachers everywhere. And what's your website? Uh, it's jeremysiskin.com. That's jeremysiskind.com. Jeremy S is kind. I love it. Uh, well, look, guys, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been wonderful to chat. Uh, we could go on for much longer, but we'll wrap it up there. Um, Frederick, all the best for your performing. Jeremy, all the best for your uh, etude sales, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you, Tim, for putting this together. You're welcome. See you later, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Frederick and Jeremy, two fantastic, incredibly talented performers and composers. And do check out the links that we've put on our show notes page, topmusic.co slash episode 179 for all the links that uh, the guys talked about. And um, yeah, make sure you have a chat with your students about their performing and how you can help them and have a bit of a think about ways that you can help them um, with some of the tips that we discussed today. All right. Now, next week on the podcast, it's someone that I've wanted to interview for about two years. She's a composer that's going to be very well known to most of you. She writes for Alfred and is published by Alfred. I have used her music for years and years and years. I published some of her pieces in the Piano for Leisure series books here that I created with the Amy B a few years back. Yes, it is the one and only Melody Boba joining me on the show next week. I can't wait to introduce you to her and uh, share the conversation that I had with her right in the midst of moving house and doing all sorts of things. We managed to grab about an hour and uh, we had a great conversation. I'm Tim Topham and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next week. Now, just before you go, if you enjoyed today's show, I'd love for you to check out my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community. It's the go-to resource for piano teachers looking to continue their professional development, connect with other teachers and experts from around the world, and to access hundreds of world-class training resources, including our academy courses, lesson plans, teaching videos, technology help, and much more. Whether you're just starting out or have been working hard to build your studio for a while, the Inner Circle community will give you the skills, support and confidence you need to grow the studio of your dreams, whether that's about teaching a small number of students one-on-one -on -one in your home or hiring a commercial space, employing other teachers and building an entire music teaching empire. With courses on both the teaching and business side of running your studio, live coaching and our thriving community forums, you can get quick answers to questions, set yourself challenges, get feedback on your ideas and feel confident teaching in new and exciting ways. For more information on how to join us inside the inner circle today, head over to timtopham.com slash community and we'll see you on the inside. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.